You can look in your Bible to Psalms 107, Psalms 107. Uh, Christmas di displays have already been in stores for a couple of weeks. There's been uh, that time frame where you could pick out a Santa outfit and let it be your Halloween costume all at the same time, that gap there. We can't really get mad at Walmart or Hobby Lobby or Amazon for doing that because, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're just in the business of making money, and apparently Americans are in the business of spending money, and so that's, that's how that works. But uh, there's a, a, a time frame between Halloween and, and Christmas that we kind of we overlook. And maybe that's, it doesn't, we shouldn't really expect much that Thanksgiving will be relegated to one day, maybe if you're lucky, two days, and then a very, very dry bird. That's what Thanksgiving is noted for. In fact, that bird is so dry, you know, it takes a gallon of sweet tea to get it down. And, and, and then after that, you know what happens 30 minutes after you eat the dry bird for Thanksgiving? You go into a coma. I mean, it's, it's medically proven you go into a coma after that. Well, believing that Christians ought to be the most thankful people on the earth, I want us to spend the four Sundays in November talking about being thankful souls. And we're going to do that all from Psalms 107. So the entire month, we're going to be studying Psalms 107. Psalms 107 is the beginning of the fifth and final section in the book of Psalms. And so if you look at your Bible, if you have a study Bible, and if you look at your Bible right now, you'll see Psalms 107. And then right above that, you'll see where it says book five. It'll have the Roman numeral five, book five. So it is the fifth and final section of the longest book in the Bible. And this section, even though all of Psalms deals with praise and prayer and, and thanksgiving, this final section is the richest, uh, the, the, the fullest section of praise songs and, thank, and thanksgiving songs out of, all, uh, out of all the Psalms. And so it would do us well to study Psalms 107 from the angle of thanksgiving. And uh, we're going to look at, at, at uh, Psalms 107 in the first three verses tonight, uh, today, and the first three verses are, are about the theme of the entire song. You know, not, not always when you hear a song today do you get the, the theme of the song off the bat. Normally it comes in the course towards the end. But in this psalm, the, the writer gives us the theme from the very beginning. And the theme is that redeemed people are going to be thankful people. That, that's, that's what this psalm is about. So let's look at Psalms 107. Let's look at the, three, the first three verses, and we'll just work our way through these verses. So Psalms 107, verse 1 says this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Now, if you write in your Bible, you need to underline that, okay? In fact, you probably need to write it down on an index card and keep it somewhere close by. You need to put it on, on the screen of your phone that we can give thanks to the Lord because he is good. Now, keep going. It says, his faithful love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the power of the foe and has gathered them from the lands from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Now, some believe that Psalms 107 was actually written in the exile period as the Israelites, after 70 years of being in exile in Babylon, that they have been released and they're headed back to Jerusalem. And that maybe this was one of their worship songs that they sang as they were rebuilding the temple. That's what's in Nehemiah and Ezra. In those two books of the Bible, it talks about re rebuilding the temple. And so maybe as they're uh, cleaning out the ground and getting the foundation ready. Maybe as they're putting up the side beams or the rafters, they are singing this praise song. Now, I, I don't know if that's when this psalm actually was written or not, but I do know that this psalm is about that redeemed people should be thankful people. Now, let's just start with verse 1 and work our way through. The first thing I want you to see is in the first phrase, of verse 1, I've already emphasized it. We should give thanks because God is good. Now let's look at that word thanks for a minute. The word thanks in the Hebrew language, which this was originally written in, means to hold out the hand. It means to extend the hand as in giving worship or thanks to God. It is an extensive 
act of worship. That's what the word thanks means. And then it says in that verse, it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Now, what, what does it mean when it says that God is good? And how can God be good if he allows evil and wickedness to exist in our world today? How could God still be good? Well, two things to consider there. First, what God allows now is not what God will always allow. So God's allowing wickedness now. He's allowing pain and disease to occur now. But that doesn't mean that he's always going to do that. It is true that God has given Satan permission on the earth now that he has some authority, he has some reign, but that is a limited, that's, that's not a permanent situation. But also the reason why God can still be good, even though there is evil and suffering in the world today, is that what we might see as pain and suffering, God may actually see as a way to move us closer to him. So what we see as something that is hurtful and painful, may actually, God may use that to move us closer to him. Have you known somebody, don't raise your hand, have you known somebody that they went through a sickness or they went through some tremendous trial, a financial crisis, a relationship issue, and that drew them closer to God? Most of us can think of people that that happened to, and so God can use what appears to be pain and suffering to bring people closer to him. Listen to this statement. If the highest gain possible for mankind is to know and relate to God. Okay, so if that's the highest gain for people is to know and relate to God, then anything that moves us in that direction is good. So that would mean that disease and pain and suffering and tragedy and trials, if the highest gain is to move us to God, to have a relationship with God, then if those things, depression, discouragement, if they move us towards God, then they are good things. Therefore, God can still be good even though he allows pain and suffering because his ultimate goal is to push us, to lead us to him. So first, we should give thanks because God is good. Secondly, the second phrase of verse 1, God is good because he faithfully loves. That's one of the reasons why he's good is that he faithfully loves. I like how the message reads. It says, his love never runs out. God's love never runs out. God's love is big enough to meet you where you're at and powerful enough not to leave you where you're at. Now, I can look at your face and tell you didn't get that. God's love is powerful enough to find you where you're at and yet strong enough not to leave you in that condition. Well, let's look at that word, faithful love. It's, it's one word in the Hebrew language, faithful love. It's a noun indicating mercy and goodness and faithfulness and love, acts of kindness. It, it's an aspect of God that it supports several other attributes of God. For example, justice, righteousness, and goodness and truth. Let, let, let me explain what I mean by that. If God is not faithful in his love, then how can he tell the truth? If God is not faithful in his love, then how can he be just? If God is not faithful in his love, how can he be right? If God is not faithful in his love, how can he be good? So the fact that God is faithful in his love supports all the other attributes of God. Psalms 136 is probably the best explanation for this phrase, his love endures forever, or that his love is faithful. And that famous Psalms 136 26 times in that short psalm, the psalmist writes that his love endures forever. He's trying to emphasize that the fact that God's love is faithful supports everything else about God. The entire span from creation that God started to his redemptive work to preserving us to God purchasing a permanent dwelling place for us in heaven are all supported by the faithfulness of God's love. Now, this means that God isn't an egomaniac. He, he, his intent is not to cause all these bad things to happen because he has such an ego that he's going to 
pull us to himself or push us to himself by causing all these bad things to happen. God is not a, an egomaniac. On, on, on the other hand, God is always operating for your good. You may think that it's a terrible thing. You may say, I don't ever want to go through, through this again. But God is doing it to preserve you. He is doing it to move you towards him. It shows that God is gracious, that he's faithful in his love. It creates a relationship with him, and that is the highest good that we could accomplish. That leads me to the third thing to look at in verse 2, the first phrase of verse 2. Recipients of his faithful love should say so. This translation that I'm reading from, the Christian Standard says, let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim. I like how the old King James Version says, it says, uh, let, let the redeemed say so. You know, if you're redeemed, say it, declare it, sing it, talk to other people about it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, if the immediate context, and again, I use the word if, if the immediate context was the Jewish people who had been in captivity in Babylon in exile for 70 years, if they're being freed and they're going to Jerusalem, as they're making that trip and as they're entering into Jerusalem, this would be quite a song to sing. They would be declaring, man, we are redeemed people. We're going to sing it. We're going to declare it. We're going to let everybody know it. And instead, today, Christians act like we're the saddest people, act like we're the most uninspired people on the earth, and the redeemed ought to say so. If we really are, are, are redeemed, it ought to say something to us. Now, let's look at three words there in that first phrase of verse 2 to help us unpack this concept. First is the word redeemed. If you haven't figured it out yet, that's kind of the theme of today. Okay, we've got redeemed songs, and now we've got a redeemed passage. So we need to know what that word redeemed means. The word means to act as a redeemer to a deceased kinsman. Now, that principle doesn't... Uh, we, we don't have it in our, our culture, but in that culture, it very much was the case. So if a family member died, your responsibility, if you were the nearest kinsman, your responsibility was to take care of that person's family. You were to financially take care of their children. You were to take care of their spouse. You were to take care of any indebtedness that they have. And so you were to pay out of your money, out of your pocket, you were to redeem what had been lost because of death. Also, it could apply to slavery. Sometimes in that day, if you could not pay your debt, they just threw you into slavery. And so a, a family member could come and buy you out of your indebtedness and, and put you back in a free condition. And theologically, God uses this word, not only in the Old Testament, but even more in the New Testament, he uses this word to describe spiritually what happens to each of us. Spiritually, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. And God pays the price to buy us out of that death and put us into a living relationship with him. All of us were in chains. We were all spiritually enslaved to our own sin, self, and Satan. And God steps down through history, through the person of Jesus Christ, who lives a sinless life, dies on the cross as a payment to get you out of slavery. So first there is the word redeemed. The second word, it says redeemed of the Lord. It says let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's talk about that term of the Lord. See, we are not just redeemed people. We are redeemed by God. And that word Lord there is the Hebrew word Yahweh. Maybe you've heard it. And the word Yahweh means the pre-existent, always existent, eternal God. It's the favorite word or the most often used word in the Old Testament for God. And what it means is that God doesn't have a beginning. He's always existed. He always will exist. It's a word used of God's everlasting power. So in other words, I'm... I'm not redeemed out of a short-term, temporary, self-made idol. I'm redeemed by the everlasting God. I, I, I am not redeemed by material gain. That's temporary. I'm not redeemed by a 401k. I'm not redeemed by my nine-year-old winning some championship. I'm not redeemed because I got the hot girl to go to homecoming with me. I'm not redeemed because of a sexual conquest. All those 
are, are temporary idols that the world says will make you happy, but they do not last. There is only one that can redeem us. He is the one who's always existed, always will exist. It is God himself. So the redeemed of the Lord finally will say so. That's what it says. It says in verse 2, in my translation, it says, they will proclaim. Now that word say so, or the word proclaim, it's really a rich word. It has three aspects to it. First, it means to speak the words. So if you're a redeemed person, you ought to tell people, I'm saved. I've asked Christ to be my Savior. I'm redeemed. You ought to say it. But also, it includes the mental part that helped form that word. So it is a mental aspect as well that helped form that language. But then thirdly, it also includes the actions that line up with being redeemed. In other words, I can't just say I'm redeemed and then act like I'm not redeemed. I can't say I'm redeemed and then live like a lost person. I've got to say I'm redeemed because it came from my mind, and then I've got to live like I'm redeemed. So the redeemed of the Lord will say so. I like how uh, the contemporary English version says it. It says, everyone the Lord has rescued from trouble should praise him. Man, if you were lost and realized you were spiritually lost, you've been rescued. You've been saved. I like how the message reads, all of you set free by God, tell the world. Tell the world. Anything short of hell is God's mercy. Anything short of hell is God's mercy. And the fact that you are here today, that God has given you another day, and God has put you in a situation in which you're hearing the truth of God's word shows that God is extending mercy to you. Like a contemporary song that I hear uh, nowadays uh, by the group Cain. I think the name of it is Blessed. But it has a phrase in it that on the best day, I'm a child of God. And on my worst day, I'm a child of God. Man, if you can't give thanks knowing that you're a child of God, there is an issue. There's an issue about being redeemed of the Lord because if you were, you would say so. Redemption is proof of God's goodness, and therefore, we should say so. That leads me to the third thing, the uh, fourth thing to look at. So we, we've seen that we should give thanks to God because he's good. We've seen that God is good because he's faithful. We've seen that recipients of his faithful love should say so. And now, fourthly, redeemed people have been saved from something to something. We've been saved from, actually, we've been, we've been saved from something to someone. We've been saved from sin, and we've been saved to a relationship with God. Verse 3 talks about how we have been rounded up from all over the world, from all uh, the four winds of the corners of the earth and from the seven seas, we've been rounded up from all that for salvation. So the psalmist refers to all places that God might find us. Today, God might find you in the corner of destitute. You might be alone. You may feel deported. You may feel enchained by something. You may feel lost, and God has found you. This very day, God has chased you down, and in all places, you tried to hide from God in a church. And he has chased you down today, and he is saying, my redemption is available. That's what it means in verse 3 when it says, from all the four winds, God has come, and he's provided this salvation. That, that term and gathered them out of the lands. Some people believe that it's the psalmist is writing back to the days of Egypt when they were freed in Moses' day. Some people think, again, that it was in the exile period and it was during the exile at Babylon, and that's what it's talking about. Some people believe it's talking about something as recent as May 14, 1948. Now, in the first service, we had some people who actually knew that day. In this service, probably not, not so much. But historically, when I say it, you'll know what I'm talking about. On May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel came into existence after not being a nation for 2,500 years. 
Can you imagine being an ethnic people but scattered all over the world and not being a nation? And then finally, the powers to be declare that Israel can be an actual nation and gives them a part of the land that they had in the Old Testament, gives them a part of that land. And now that land is actually Israel today. After 2,500 years not existing as a nation. So that would definitely be bringing them from all four corners of the world and, 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 and bringing restoration and redemption. But even at that, I think there, it actually means something greater than that. I, I, I believe that God is gathering from all the lands, from the east and the west and the north and the south. And that refers to God redeeming people from all corners of life out of bondage and sin and death and bringing them into a glorious relationship with Jesus Christ. At the end of the service, we're going to baptize two uh, teenagers. One was saved a couple of years ago. The other one was saved more recently. They have been redeemed. They have been gathered from the corner of where they were at, and God has transferred them into his life. In short, God redeems me from hell, from death, from punishment, and he redeems me into a relationship with Christ that ends up resulting in heaven. Therefore, I should be thankful. You know, there's not much we can do for God. You think about this for a little bit. We say a lot in our prayers, God, we want to do this for you. God, we want to do this. But when you, when you really think about it, there's not much we can do for God. I mean, like, for example, we, we can't give our money to God. God is not broke. He does not need our money. Now, we give because we want to be thankful and we want to express obedience in faith, and, that, and, that, and that's true. But let's be honest. God's not up in heaven saying, man, I sure hope those people at McClendon come through for me today or I'm not going to be able to eat. I mean, God is not in need of money. So we can't give our money to God. We can't give our service to God. Now, we say it all the time, and our, and our intentions are right. We say, God, we want to serve you today. God, help me serve you today. But honestly, God doesn't need our service. God could actually beckon angels that, by the way, would be much swifter and much more efficient than any of us to do his service if that's all he wanted was service. So what does God really want from us? God wants our thanks. He wants our praise which is another way of saying he wants our worship. He wants us to give him worth. He wants us to recognize the value that he is in our lives. And if we do that, then the redeemed of the Lord will say so. Fanny Crosby was born March 24th, 1820. When she was six weeks old, she became blind because of an illness. She wrote her first poem at the age of nine. When she died at 94, she was credited with 9,000 poems. Most of them we know more because they were set to hymns, to music. Such songs as to God be the glory, rescue the perishing, Jesus keep me near the cross, blessed assurance. In the fall of 1850, Fanny Crosby was in invited to attend a series of revival services by a friend. She didn't really want to go, but reluctantly, she went to the revival service. Well, the first night of the revival, the, what we call the invitation. We're going to have one in just a minute. It was when we sing that song and the minister stand up here. Well, they had an invitation song. She came to the front. Nothing happened. Second night, she goes, again, the invitation time comes. She comes to the front. Nothing happens. Third night, she returns, and as they are singing that what we call an invitation song, that night they were singing Isaac Watts' song, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. And they were, the congregation had moved to the fifth and final stanza of that song, and these are the words that she heard. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. And she began to cry. And she made her way to the front, and she realized that that was the barrier, that she had to give all of herself away, that God would not accept anything else. Some people in this world, like Fanny Crosby, they want a little bit of religion and a little bit of the world, and God won't have anything to do with it. God says, you've got to give it all up. 
And that's all that we can do is give it all up. So she did, and it changed her life. She was asked if there were songs that she wrote that best described her conversion. And she replied that she said, quote, I would write many hymns to describe the joy of my salvation, but the one that stands out the most is redeemed how I love to proclaim it. That old hymn, the first stanza says, redeem how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Are you redeemed? In other words, have you come to a definite point in your life where you admit that you are a sinner and that you cannot solve your own sin problem? And you believe the only solution to your sin is that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. And with all that you are, you're going to embrace that. You're not going to have one hand on God and one hand on the world. With all that you are, you're going to surrender to that. If that doesn't describe you here in a minute, we're going to have one of those songs, an invitation song, a decision song. Ministers are going to be standing in the front, and I want you to come and tell one of us, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. But the second question to look at as we go to the next slide, the second question is, if you are redeemed, are you saying so? Last week I introduced the concept of who's your one? Surely someone that you love and you're praying for eventually wouldn't, want, wouldn't you want to tell them, I'm a Christian. I've, I've been redeemed. This is how it happened in my life. Wouldn't you say so? When you're at home and you're working around the house, wouldn't a song just come out of your mouth about God if you really are redeemed? If you're driving down the road, wouldn't you be jamming to some good Christian music? When you come to church with other believers, wouldn't a natural outflow be, I wanna, I'm redeemed, and so I want to say so. I want to declare it. I want to say it, say it. So if you are redeemed, would you say so? Let's bow our heads as the musicians make their way to the front. Those that are going to be baptized can slip out. So with your head bowed, I ask you to bow your head because I want you to really concentrate on uh, the next few moments First, I want you to kind of think of what's going on inside your spirit, what's going on inside your, your soul right now. Are you convicted that you have never committed your life to Christ as Savior? If you're honest, just between you and God, is there a, <clears throat> is there a conviction that you've never committed your life to Christ? You are not redeemed. Would that explain why there's so many things that are discouraging and depressing in your life because you've never given your life to Christ? Here in just a minute, we're going to sing a song. I don't want you to wait until halfway through the song. In the very first words of the song, I want you to come from the balcony or from the back or the front of the church, and I want you to just come to one of the ministers and say, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. And then for those of us that are redeemed and we have been acting like the world is going to uh, defeat us, that what happens in politics is going to defeat us, and we've been living a defeated life, as a Christian, would you ask for forgiveness and say, God, I'm redeemed and I'm going to start saying so. God, use this time to do your best work in my life and in the lives of people in this room. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.